we've been going through a series uh, uh, for the past 13 weeks called Thinking Biblically. And uh, this has been a 13-week series, and so if you've missed part of it, let me just bring you up to speed about where we're at. Uh, the first two weeks of this series, we talked about a, a baseline authority of how we know to trust the Bible and how we know that we can trust God completely. Because all of the other things we're going to teach about how to think biblically flow from that we can trust God and trust God's word. Uh, weeks three through nine, we thought about how to think biblically about stewardship, of how we can best utilize what God has given us for his glory. So we took a look at how we can best utilize our heart, our time, our talents, our treasure, our temple, and our testimony. That's how we're thinking biblically about each of those things. And then the last three weeks, what we've been doing is how to think biblically about the kinds of things that have potential to distract us in life from doing God's purpose for us. So things that can weigh us down or cause distraction would be uh, difficult circumstances that we're going through in life. That can weigh us down. We talked about how uh, politics can sometimes weigh us down as well or be a distraction. And then last week, about disease and brokenness that all of us may be facing. Um, next week, uh, Pastor Jeff is going to be returning here to the pulpit after his three-month sabbatical. We'll be welcoming him back, and he'll close out this summer series. Yes, Jeff, if you are listening, we, we look forward to having you back. And uh, we're going to close out the summer series with, he's going to hopefully talk on a topic he knows a lot about, which is thinking biblically about rest. And so he'll be joining us next Sunday for that. And then today, uh, I get the one that says, how to think biblically about conflict. All right, so conflict, there we go. What comes to mind when I say the word conflict? So a couple images may be coming through your head, so let's see if we can flush out a few of those. The first thing maybe is right now even the war between certain countries. Right? When I think of conflict, maybe I first think of what's going on right now in Ukraine and Russia. And in fact, one of our own church members is over in Ukraine right now. And she was asking for prayer to come out of the country safely and to return back here with us. So if we can just keep that in mind this week. Another conflict that comes off often, uh, when we see each other Sunday to Sunday, we don't see where you go to work. And so our conflicts at work between maybe a co-worker or a supervisor, that may be on your mind right now if things aren't going quite well with somebody you work with. Another conflict that may have just arisen recently for you or has arisen in the past or undoubtedly a conflict you have with friends, uh, acquaintances. Maybe there's some grudge or some bitterness right now that you just still have in your heart towards that relationship. Another one that uh, maybe happened even this morning. Uh, I know that sometimes even coming to church can create conflict in our own houses. And so maybe you're thinking right now of a conflict just, just this morning about our immediate family or some of our extended family that you may have a conflict with. And then uh, for those of you who are like, you know what, Eric, I'm thinking more of these long-term conflicts, things that are just unresolved. It has been going on for a long time and nothing seems to be able to deflate the conflict between them. That's right, folks. I'm talking about baseball and the Giants-Dodgers conflict that we see constantly. Pastor Sam, I'm thinking of you. All the times you call me out, I'm thinking of you. I'm thinking of Andy Craig right now. That's right, the Giants-Dodgers rivalry. All right. Well, when I say conflict this morning, what I'm referring to is not just a disagreement between two people. It's not just a difference of opinion, because we have that all the time. That's not what I'm referring to. I'm talking about the kind of conflict that causes a damaged or a broken relationship. And so all of us are going to go through that kind of conflict at some point in our lives where we have bitterness or anger or we're carrying a grudge against somebody else. Uh, it weighs us down emotionally. And so today we're going to talk about three major themes. The first theme is going to be what causes conflict. The second is what is our normal or natural responses to conflict. And the third is how do we resolve conflict based on what the Bible says. And uh, as you'll see in your bulletins, you'll have a nice outline to kind of keep those straight as we go through it. But some of the information this morning I'm going to talk about comes from the Peacemakers Ministry. That's a Christian organization whose mission it is to equip Christians to respond to conflict biblically. And we're going to talk more about the Peacemakers later on. But let's start out. So what causes conflicts? What causes these broken relationships? Well, we have to know that sin is at the core 
of every relational conflict. Last week, we talked about how God's ideal for the world was without sin, and there were perfect relationships, but then Pastor Sam talked about how brokenness came in, and there started to cause the relational conflict, whether it be between Adam and Eve, or Cain and Abel, or others. It's been in that way through the course of time. It's brokenness, and that was never God's design, right? God's design was for unity. Unity amongst all of believers. And we learn that from Psalm 133.1, which says how good it is when brothers dwell together in unity. And it's echoed by Jesus when he prays for his disciples right before he's about to be crucified. He prays for them and says, my prayer is that all believers may have complete unity with each other. Well, the first cause of sin, and more specifically, one of the things that the Bible addresses in James chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, it addresses how we get conflict. So let's look at that verse. James 4, 1 through 3 says this. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you murder. You covet. And you cannot obtain, so you fight and you quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. And when you, you, do, you ask, you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own passion. So one of the things that James clearly brings out is, is our selfish passions, our selfish desires that are at war within us. We want something, but when we don't get it, we either sin to get it or we sin in response to not getting what we want. Now, what is a selfish desire? It's a fair question to ask. So think about this in your own lives. Think about times when you get angry. Think about times when you go passive aggressive against someone else. Think about times when you give someone the cold shoulder. All three of those are a sign that you have a selfish desire that's being triggered right now. And uh, if you still don't know what your own selfish desires are, I'd encourage you, just ask yourself or ask someone else, well, what do I have strong emotional reactions to? Just think about that. What do you have strong emotional reactions to? That's going to be a signal to you of what a core selfish desire of yours may be. Let me give you, for example, in my own life, I went through, like with other men here at church, the, uh, the 33 series for men, uh, part of our men's Bible study. And as part of that series, you can see behind me, uh, we talked about what uh, men have a core selfish desire in three areas. Uh, the first is for comfort. We'd like just to have everything at peace, be all just good, and we want to escape any time we see things getting uncomfortable. That's one. We have a core desire for comfort. The second we have a core desire is for control. It may come as no surprise that we like to have things a certain way and a certain time. And it may not apply just to men. That may apply to everyone as well. And the third one is significance. Men like to feel very important, like other people respect us and other people value us for who we are. And that also can be a selfish desire because if we're not getting it, we may sin to get those type of things. Now, even a God-given desire can turn into a selfish desire. What do we mean by that? Well, God-given desires could be a relational closeness, financial security. Maybe it's physically that you have God-given desires for eating, for rest, for sex, for exercise. Now, any of those can turn into a selfish desire if when we don't get them the way we want them, the way, how we want them, then it turns into uh, having a sinful response or attitude or reaction to it. Let me give you just a quick example. Quick example hypothetically, I don't know where I'm drawing these examples from, let's say hypothetically a family decides they want to go swimming for exercise. And let's say in the course of that swimming expedition, all of a sudden we're doing it for exercise, but it starts to become a competition of like, well, how many laps have you swam? How many laps have you swam? Well, if I start to tell that my, that this family, I'm not saying who, but this family, hey, well, I swam this many, well, all of a sudden it could become a, well, uh, I did more laps than you did. Well, you did that that many? Well, I really want to do more laps. And all of a sudden, a God-given desire quickly turns into a sinful desire when pride and jealousy start to enter in. The third thing we want to touch on today as far as what causes broken relationships or uh, some of these conflicts is there's a popular statement out there that 90% of conflicts are caused by misunderstandings. 90% of conflicts are caused by misunderstandings. Well, I think that that assumes that there's a direct connection between a misunderstanding and a conflict, and it misses an important step in the middle, which is sin. 
Misunderstandings can lead to sin, which then causes the broken conflict or relationship. Let me give you an example. A common one I think I hear a lot of is somebody will send a, a uh, give a phone call to somebody else and say, hey, could you return my call? Or send an email or a text, hey, could you get back to me on something? Then we don't hear from that other person for a while. Well, wait, well, what's going on? Uh, the misunderstanding may develop. I may start thinking, if that's me who sent that, I may start thinking, well, do they not care about me? Do they, do they not think I'm important enough for them to respond back? Or the other side may be, they have a legitimate emergency or tragedy going on in their life. That may be the reason why they haven't responded back or they've got other issues they're dealing with. But you see then, if I start to develop a negative opinion about the other person, I start to develop bitterness towards them. So all of a sudden, the misunderstanding of why they're not responding back can turn into bitterness, which then turns into the sin of possibly, uh, or the, the sin of pride and bitterness turn into the relational conflict that I could have with that person. Now again, this is not an exhaustive list, but these are three, I think, of the major things that do cause conflict that we can see. So how do we respond to conflict? Um, I'll present to you that there's five ways we respond to conflict, three of which uh, are unbiblical responses, and two of which are biblical responses. And so the first way we respond to conflict, unbiblically, is escape. Uh, we try to avoid the conflict. We pretend it's not even there. We deny that there is a conflict, and we just say, if I just ignore it, it will go away. How do we manifest that? Well, as the picture kind of represents behind me, that it's kind of, we try to avoid the other person with the cold shoulder. That's how we know that there's some sort of a conflict we're trying to escape from, is we start giving people the cold shoulder. The second way that we respond to conflict unbiblically is by attacking verbally the person that we're in conflict with. Uh, how do we attack them verbally? Well, we blame them. We blame them and say, you're really the cause of this conflict. It's what you did is the problem. We could use harsh words. We could uh, assault them with, like our, or with, our, with the words, with our words, just like a weapon would. Uh, another way we verbally attack people is through gossip. We go ahead and say all these negative things behind somebody else's back about what they did. That's also how we attack them verbally. The third way that for those of, those of us who are really skilled at the unbiblical ways of responding to conflict, we are so good at it, we can combine numbers one and two, right? We attack, then escape. What do we mean by that? The attack, which is the, uh, I'll give you a quick, harsh comment, and then I'll quickly pass by and walk away. We're, we know that at church is the hit and run comment. People give us just a quick hit and then walk away because they don't want to engage us really in the discussion. So we have to be careful that we're not doing that because that causes conflict. And that's an inappropriate response to a conflict situation. But there's two biblical ways that we can see from Scripture about how we can actually respond to conflict better. And the first comes out of Proverbs 19.11. And Proverbs 19.11 is going to talk about overlooking the offense. Proverbs 19.11 says, Good sense makes one slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook an offense. What does that mean? Well, considering eternity, considering how our salvation that we receive from Jesus Christ, considering all those really big topics, is this particular offense a big deal? Is someone's selfish comment, someone's selfish action, is that a big deal in the grand scheme of things, or is that something we can choose to overlook? Now, I will submit to you that there may be three things or three situations where we should overlook the offense. Situation number one, it does not cause serious physical harm to someone else, to yourself or to someone else. That's an okay then to overlook the offense. Number two is when that person's conduct is not part of conduct, it's part of a destructive pattern of behavior. Because if it is part of a destructive pattern of behavior that they have, then we need to address it. We can't just overlook it because not only did it hurt us, it is likely to hurt someone else in the future. The third situation that we may choose to overlook is where that particular incident will not cause a dividing wall in our relationship. Meaning that I can see them, I can have a conversation with that person, we can go forward, and it's not, I'm not going to keep thinking about it, bring it up in my mind. Uh, let me give you a tip here. Um, you're not overlooking the offense if you're looking to avoid someone here at church. Uh, if you're going, you know what, I'm going to take a different direction here, or if I see that person, I'm going to walk around and maybe try to avoid them. There is a tip for you that your conflict with them is still exists, and you have not yet overlooked the offense. 
So those are just some tips on overlooking the offense, which is our fourth common response. And the fifth common response, or in the fifth one, which is biblical, is to take steps to reconcile the relationship. Now let me pause there for a moment, and I use the term reconcile purposely because it's different than resolving the relationship or resolving the conflict. Those are two different things. Resolution. Uh, I was dealing with this a lot in, with the court system. Uh, you were, the, uh, judges resolve conflicts all the time, meaning that they decide this side is right, this side is wrong, and then I, everybody moves on. Leaders resolve conflicts all the time. They, by their position, they say, well, this side is right, or this is the way we're going to go, and we're not going to do this way. But what that doesn't do at all is it, it does not deal with the relationship between the two people. You see, resolving the issue only resolves the issue. It deals with part of the problem. It doesn't deal with the whole problem. Reconciliation deals with both. Reconciliation deals with both resolving the issue as well as helping to restore the relationship. And we get uh, the benefit there of Romans chapter 12, verse 18. Uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 18 says, If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. That's what reconciliation sounds like biblically, is that we, as far as it depends on us, we are able to live at peace with all people. That's what true reconciliation is. Well, great, that sounds great, but how do we get there? So what are some practical steps that we can use now to, to reconcile any relationship right now that's damaged or broken in our lives? And the very first step I'll submit to you is that we have to commit to love one another. 1 John 4, 7 and 8 says this, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. So the very first thing we have to do is commit to loving one another. Why? Because all of us are created by God. God loves each of us, and therefore we are called, commanded, to love one another. But wait, Eric, wait a second. There are some people that are really, really difficult in my life. In fact, they're not only difficult, I consider them to be almost my enemy. They're constantly against me in everything I do. Well, it's a good thing the Bible addresses that as well. Matthew 5, 44 says this, But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Why is this love concept so important? Because I'll submit to you that if we don't really love them, we have no desire to be reconciled to them. We're okay allowing the conflict just to exist. We're okay with continuing to ignore them. We're okay with just saying, you know what, that's not important in my life. But truly loving people the way God intended means we want to have reconciled relationships with every person in our life. Now, the second part I'll submit to you as far as a practical step to reconcile the relationship is to own your part of the conflict. Own your part of the conflict. Let's take a look at Matthew chapter 7, verses 3 through 5. This is the one about the speck and the, the log. And it says, why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. You see, we tend to be blind to our own faults, right? It's easy to say, look at myself and go, I didn't do much wrong in that, in the conflict that I'm having. And we minimize what our contribution was and we maximize, we push the blame onto the other person. Um, in fact, there's a phrase out there or a saying that says, well, in these conflicts, uh, <clears throat> I believe that I'm only 2% at fault. Uh, the other person seems to be in my humble assessment, 98% at fault. So as soon as they want to go ahead and resolve the conflict, they can. And then I'd be happy to own up to my 2% at that point in time. Fortunately, that's not the biblical thing to do because Matthew 7, 3 through 5 says we start with ourselves first. And if we're 2% at fault, then we own our 2%. We're 100% 100 responsible for our 2% at fault. And we own that first, and we go to the other person to address our 2%. Now, you may be saying, like, well, yeah, there's conflict I have with another person, but honestly, I don't even know what caused it. I bet they do. Have you ever tried just to go up and ask them? You know what? Things seem to be a little tense between us. What's the cause of that? Is there anything we can do to make that fully reconciled? Just a thought. 
The third step that I'll submit to you that we need to do in order to resolve conflicts biblically is we need to make a good apology. Make a good apology. We're going to tell you from this day forward, after you've heard this, no longer are we going to do superficial apologies where it's like, I'm sorry. Okay, now let's, we're all good, right? We're good. Okay, I said I'm sorry. No longer. We're going to talk about seven elements to a good apology. And we're going to do this because we desire to reconcile relationships with one another. So the first element of a good apology is to address everyone involved. All the people who were affected by your sinful comment, your sinful statement, your sinful action. Uh, your confession should go as far as your sin is another way of wording that. Let me give you an example. That could be in your own home. Let's say there's multiple people in your house and you have a conflict with one other person in your house. But three other people in your house heard the conflict. When you go back to resolve with this one person, you not only need to apologize to them for what you did wrong, but you need to also apologize to the other people who heard it. That way they know you know it was wrong as well. So that's why we say it's got to go as far. How about with gossip? If you gossip just to one person about this other one, yeah, you not only need to apologize to the person you offended, but to every person who heard the gossip. That's how far the sin went. That's how far the apology needs to go. The second element of a good apology is avoid using the words if or but in your apology. That's right, if or but. Public figures or politicians or other people may, may have press conferences. They say something like this. <clears throat> If I offended anyone, then I'm sorry. I mean, if you offended somebody, you're not owning that you actually think you offended somebody. You don't think you did. You're just doing that because you want everyone else to think better about you. So we avoid the if statement. We also avoid the but statement because the but statement tends to cast blame on the other person. Let me give you an example. I'm sorry that you were offended, but you're just so sensitive. Hmm. Really? It's the other person's fault that they accepted it that way? It's not that you did something wrong with your words? How about this but statement? I'm sorry, but you did all of these things, and that caused me to react the way I did. Wait a second. We got to start, like Matthew says, own our own stuff first before we ever take a look at what the other person did. The third uh, element of a good apology is to admit specifically what you did, both your specific attitudes and your specific actions that you did wrong. Be specific. These are no longer going to be apologies like, well, whatever I did wrong, I'm sorry for all of it. Are we good now? No. What we're going to do is we're going to admit specifically what we did wrong. Why? Because that makes the other person know, you know, they know why you're apologizing. They know the specific act that you know was wrong that hurt them. And that's why it's important to be specific. Number four, we need to acknowledge the hurt that we caused. How did our sin impact them? If I step into their shoes for a moment, and I was me, and I did the exact same thing to them, how would this person feel when I had committed my sin against them? And you acknowledge that verbally. You say, I know what it was like when I said these things to you. It made you feel, uh, boy, it just made you feel bad. It made you feel like you were less important. It made you feel like you weren't valued. It made you feel like whatever it is, you put yourself in their shoes to see how did it make them feel in your, as part of your good apology. Number five, you need to be willing to accept the consequences. Let's say that your sinful action caused uh, property damage in some way, or you need to pay for it. So re restitution, you may need to pay for what you did wrong. Uh, let's say that your sin was a moral sin. You may now need to accept maybe some uh, accountability or restrictions on what you do. And at this point, I just want to just uh, uh, applaud uh, the men who are going through the war path and the conquer series. You're taking serious steps to address something, put restrictions on your life, to accept accountability, to eliminate this. And I want to say thank you for doing that, and it's a job well done. Number six, what we need to do with a good apology is we need to alter our behavior. So you see here that uh, altering your behavior means I'm going to promise not to do this same thing again. And that lets the other person know you're serious about it. That it's not just I'm sorry you caught me and I plan to do it again, but rather not only that you caught me, but rather I don't want to do this action again. That's because I know the harm it caused you and I know the ramifications of it. Number seven, we need to ask for forgiveness. The very end of going through these steps, it's very important we actually ask the other person to forgive us. Now, when you ask, you need to allow time. Why? 
because they could be deeply hurt by you. And if they've been deeply hurt by you, they need to actually take time to come to a point of wanting to forgive you, to truly reconcile the relationship. These seven things that are, you see behind me, uh, it's not just a checklist. These are principles. So it's not like you have to go, well, hold on, I've covered one through five and seven. I need to cover six, you know, to make a good apology. We all know what a good apology sounds like. We all know what an insincere apology sounds like. So make a good apology. Cover these principles in your apology. But let me offer you this tip, that during the apology, this is not the time to point out what the other person did wrong. It's not like in the middle of your apology of going through these points, you get to go, well, and what about you? Isn't it, hey, 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 isn't it time for you to say something? That is not helpful to accomplishing the apology. But if you give a good apology to somebody, and you own your part of it, you're sincere in your apology, then they may want to reciprocate and say, you know what? I also did some things wrong that contributed to our conflict. And they may want to do that immediately. So that's all about how to make a good apology. Now, the fourth part of how to reconcile the relationship biblically is at some point, though, we do need to address what the other person did in the conflict. Now, if the other person doesn't immediately respond, like after you've apologized, they don't immediately just jump in and say, you know what? I did some things too. I need to apologize as well. And you determine you can't just overlook the offense, maybe because it's going to hurt your relationship going forward. Then you do need to take the initiative to go to them proactively to see if the relationship can be fully reconciled. Uh, good news is this, is that if you're a Christian, the Bible gives us a good three-part outline of how we're supposed to go to another Christian and try to resolve what they've done to sin against us. And that comes out of Matthew 18, verses 15 through 17. These three steps are found right there for how Christians are to deal with one another in these conflict situations. Matthew 18 says this, If your brother sins against you, Go to him and tell him his fault. Between you and him, get this, alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. So we see here that step number one is a one-on-one -on -one meeting between two Christians. And this is a practical tip. This is not best done over the phone, via email, or text unless it's absolutely necessary. The best is face-to-face -face because you can see the other person's reactions. You can listen to what they have to say. Now, I'll say this about the one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, uh, let's go back to a situation we find ourselves in as staff. Somebody will come up and tell us, hey, let's just call that person uh, John. Uh, John did such and such, and so uh, you staff should go handle that. And, and Jack is the one telling us about this. And Pastor Jeff, in, all, in his wisdom, has directed the staff to respond to that person this way. Well, well uh, Jack, uh, how did John respond when you told him the same thing you just told me? Hmm, well... I don't know, Jack didn't exactly respond to that. Because John didn't respond to it because I didn't exactly tell John about it before telling you. Well, that's where we need to change that behavior. And going forward, we all need to make sure that we've gone one-on-one -on -one to the person first and tried to reconcile the relationship with them before we get others involved. Which gets us into step number two, which is to then, if you need to, take two people back with you if step number one, the one-on-one -on -one meeting, doesn't work. Why do you take two people or three people with you to the next meeting? It's not just to fence them in and make them feel like they're, they're being cornered, but rather it's this. It's, it can prevent the conflict from escalating. If you've been in a mediation setting, and I've been in several of those, a conflict doesn't escalate when you have more people sitting around the room. People don't want to lose their temper. They don't want to say things that are inappropriate because other people are watching them. And that gives some level of accountability. It also provides accountability so that one person doesn't just walk out and say, you know what, I'm out of here. I don't really want to deal with this. Because it provides the accountability of two, uh, three other Christian brothers who are there to make sure that both parties are going to stick it out to see whether the relationship can, in fact, be reconciled. Which then gets us to the third step. If that, the bringing two does not work, then you take it to the church governing body, which in our case at Redwood Chapel, here's our board of elders. Why do we take it to the board of elders at that point? You have to remember then what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And you remember that he said there that Christians are to avoid lawsuits between believers. 
Uh, he, Paul even goes as far as to say, it's better that a Christian be wronged or cheated than to take the dispute before unbelievers in a court of law. So that's why we take it before the elders as our third step in order to try and resolve these relational conflicts between believers. But what if we're dealing with a situation where the other side is unwilling to come to these meetings? Uh, what if we're dealing with a corporation where, hey, you dealt with their customer service rep and they said, sorry, there's nothing we can do for you. Um, what if they don't want to continue in the reconciliation process? Then what is your remedy? Well, I'll speak quickly to this, but uh, I want to make sure that when I say this, you know that there's a much longer discussion that needs to be had before any action is taken. There may be times where you do need to exercise legal remedies, whether that be civil or criminal. But there's a lot of ramifications and a lot of other facts that need to go into that discussion before you do it. And we don't have time to gather all of that today. But what I can tell you is what the Bible says. If you find yourself in that situation where the other person doesn't want to resolve with you, and you're contemplating what your remedy should be, then think about what Romans chapter 12, verses 17 through 21 says. And maybe we can get that on the board. It says, repay no one evil for evil but give thought to, to do what is honorable in the sight of all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So we see there are some practical steps that even while we're in the midst of a conflict, how we should be treating the other person. But now let me return to the situation where both sides have actually come together, both sides have offered apologies, and now we're at that critical final step where the other side has asked forgiveness of you. What should you do in response? And that comes to our final step, which is you need to offer forgiveness without reservation. Why? Because forgiveness is a command given by God. Let's take a look at Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 through 15. It says, Jesus says this, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Good news. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. That's the bad news. So you see here, forgiveness is so important, and you can think about it this way. Think about how much you've sinned in life. Think about how many things God has forgiven you of your sins. Now think, in contrast to that, the sin that just took place against you. In light of all of these sins that God's forgiven you of, wouldn't it be very easy to forgive somebody of the one or two sins they committed against you? That's why the, Jesus gives us that command to forgive as the Lord forgives us. And so if you are going to offer forgiveness, then you need to know it comes with four promises. The four promises of forgiveness are this. Number one, I'm not going to continue to dwell on the incident or the sinful action against me. I may still remember it, but I'm not going to just continually let it go through my head and kind of think about it constantly whenever I see this person. Number two promise is that I'm not going to bring up the incident again to use against them. I'm going to leave it in the past. We're going to drop it. We're not going to have to discuss that again. We've moved forward from that place. Number three, I'm not going to gossip about that incident with other people. I'm not going to just go around telling everybody else about this issue we just had. But it is at this point appropriate to say you can go talk to a counselor. It is appropriate to go get counseling in some situations where you've been sinned against. Why is that appropriate to even talk whatever you need to in a counselor setting? Because it's a private, confidential setting where they're not going to take the information and go announce it to other people to disparage that person's character. You can deal with the healing process there with a Christian counselor, I might add, uh, without having to disparage that other person's reputation. That's not being gospel there because you're not affecting their reputation by talking behind their back where it's likely to spread to other people. And then that gets us to the fourth promise that of, 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 of forgiveness, which is I'm not going to allow this incident to hinder our relationship going forward. When I see you, we're going to be able to have a normal conversation. I'm no longer going to try to avoid you. If I see you, I'm not going to go passive aggressive or give you the cold shoulder. I'm not going to try to attack you with my words again. Lots of information. Good stuff. But what do we do with it? What's our next step? 
to how to reconcile any broken or damaged relationships right now in our own lives. Some of you may be sitting there going, you know what, good stuff. Yes, totally agree. You know what, this week though, I, you have no idea. Labor Day is coming up, I am slammed with work. I've got so many things to do. Uh, you know what, after Labor Day, I'll pick this up again and we'll deal with it. If that's your, your, your thinking right now, let me just remind you about a few things that Scripture says. The first is that we're supposed to deal with our conflicts quickly before they escalate. And this concept of dealing with conflicts quickly is important to God. Let's take a look at Matthew chapter 23, verses 23 and 24, which says this. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. So my challenge for you is this. I don't think this is a next week type issue. I think this is if you really right now have a conflict with somebody else in your life that we've discussed, the call is to resolve it even before we gather next Sunday and try to see if some of these steps will help us resolve that relationship. So that may mean the second practical step you walk out here with is i got to initiate contact with somebody that I really don't want to talk to all that much. I've got to take that initiation. And so let me remind you here that forgiveness is something that you can do on your own. You don't actually have to be with them. You can forgive them of what they've done. But to reconcile the relationship, which is God's desire for this church to have unity in, for all of us as believers in any church to have unity, then we need to be the ones to seek reconciliation, which is both parties coming together. Now, reconciliation takes time. If you're thinking, I'm swamped this week, but Eric, okay, you said it, I will try it, I will reach out. I've got 10 minutes on Wednesday. I gotta tell you that if this conflict has been going on for a long time, 10 minutes is not gonna help it. You need to be willing to set aside the time and deal with any issue to resolve that conflict. This could take hours, but I'll tell you in a moment that it's worth it. It is worth it to invest the time to reconcile relationships and be at peace with others. So the third action item that you may think about today is that, you know what, these are good things, but Eric, you went by them so fast. You're a quick talker. I've always told you you're a quick talker, and I just can't take notes that fast. I get it. Thank you. But what we have, though, is Redwood Chapel has already has these materials. We have a DVD here from the Peacemakers about how to resolve conflict. We have workbooks about how to do this. We've led small groups here before, but you know what? It's been of over six, seven, maybe ten years since the last time we had a small group on resolving conflict. Maybe you need to talk to Pastor Corey at the end of this service and say, you know what? This needs more time. Let's really dive into these issues. I'd like to lead a small group on resolving conflict. The materials are all here. All you have to do is put in the DVD and then go through the materials. It's that easy for you to get more resources. You may, though, go, you know what? I just need to talk to somebody else. I need to seek godly counsel about a situation I'm having right now. Well, if that's the situation you're in, let me reassure you about this. That even Rehoboam, back in 1 Kings chapter 12, he sought out the council of elders in order to figure out what his right next step should be. Proverbs, in no short of like eight or, eight or nine different proverbs, all say the importance of seeking godly counsel before you make decisions. Because the more counselors you have, the better your decision will be. So the key thing there is to seek out disinterested parties who are not part of your direct conflict and somebody that's not going to be affected by it. But rather you're going to them, not to disparage the character of somebody else, but you're going to say, what's the next right step I need to take? Because I do want to help resolve this conflict. The final thing that you may be thinking about today as a next step is that this whole Thinking Biblically series, and you've seen that graphic up there now for 12 weeks, is that are we willing to change our lives to God's truth or do we try to change God's truth to fit our own lives? So how does that apply today? If you're currently in a conflict situation, a relational conflict with somebody else, do you continue to not resolve it and go, that was a great sermon, I've got lunch plans? Or do you actually take steps this week to move forward to resolving the conflict? That's the question. Are you going to let it sit there or are you going to do something about it? So let me offer you this. Since I started drafting this sermon over now three months ago is when I started working on this since I finished the last one. I've had more conflicts in my life since I started drafting this. And so I couldn't get up here before you today until I had taken active steps to try to resolve each and every one of them. And I will tell you this, 
after going through those long conversations, after going through those processes, I have more peace and more joy now than I did in the middle of the conflicts. It works. That said, if you ever plan to teach, preach on this topic again, let me just advise you, your next three months are going to be difficult. That said, it is well worth it. So let's go to God in prayer about what our next steps are. Father, we come to you because we all need courage to take the next right step. It's one thing to say we should do it. It's another thing to actually do it. And Father, we need courage then to approach people about how we should try to resolve these conflicts. And we know that these relational things are a two-way street. So Father, my prayer is that people will desire to move quickly. Not let another Sunday go by where we worship here knowing that we have relational conflicts in place. Would you please, Lord, help give us the courage to do that, the words to say. Uh, help us, Lord, to make a good apology. If we've done anything wrong, help us to use these principles today to make a true good apology so that we can be reconciled back again. And Father, this can't be just because our own effort says so. It has to be because the Holy Spirit is guiding us and giving us the words to say. So Holy Spirit, would you please help each one of us to do the things that we don't want to do this week to help resolve and reconcile these conflicts in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.